Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to episode number 70 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. Thanks so much for taking time out to listen in. Um, As I mentioned in the most recent episode of the Family History podcast, I have been busily working on some classes for the brand new Family Tree University being created by the folks over at Family Tree Magazine. They're putting together online classes all about genealogy. And right now, I am putting the finishing touches on my class called Google Tools. Now, we've talked about the various um, Google Tools on on both of the podcasts. And in this class, we're going to wade in all the way and go in-depth with four of the best tools for genealogists. The classes are going to be multimedia on our terrific new website, and students are going to be able to interact with their teachers. And Google Tools is just the first of three initial classes that I'm putting together for the university. And in fact, one of the Google Tools I'm going to be covering is the Google News Archive. And Diane Haddad over at the Genealogy Insider blog just reported on the fact that Google announced last week that it has quadrupled its searchable archive for historical news articles. The new additions include the Halifax Gazette, dating as far back as 1753, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, the Village Voice, and the Manila Standard, uh, and the Nation from Thailand, and other newspapers. And Diane writes... When you search, you can specify keywords or phrases such as an ancestor's name or an event to include or exclude, provide a date range, and opt to get articles written in a particular language or from a certain newspaper. You can also choose whether to see only articles that are free to access. And of course, if you do a timeline search, you're going to get a timeline on the top of your results showing the numbers of matching articles by year. And then you can just adjust the timeline to see articles uh, within different time spans. So it looks like this class that I'm working on is coming out at a great time to take advantage of all of these new um, newspapers that are coming online. So stay tuned for more about that in the coming weeks, and um, I hope to have you in one of my classes. And let's see what else is going on in the world of genealogy. Um, The National Archives just announced that it has launched what it calls a narrations blog. Get it? Narrations? (laughs) Narrations? The new blog is going to focus on online public access to records of the U.S. National Archives. Now, according to their press release, the narrations blog Uh, was created to begin a discussion with researchers on the future of online public access at the National Archives. The public is invited and encouraged to share opinions on ways to enhance the online researcher experience and to increase access to archival materials. This online community will continue to be a work in progress as we develop new features and content. Questions will be posted to invite discussion, and the blog welcomes feedback and suggestions for new questions to raise. The blog will also inform researchers about newly available online records, descriptions, and digitized archival materials. And they definitely want to hear from you. They want to know what kinds of things that you would find valuable to discuss on the blog. Uh, A couple of initial questions that they are pondering are, Should they allow the public to tag descriptions in their online catalog? Why or why not? That would be an interesting topic, and I know there's folks already over there talking about it. Um, What groups of photographs should they post on Flickr next and why? And do you have a favorite NARA photograph or document? Is it already available in their catalog or on their website? So it it really does sound like this blog is a way to leave comments and share your opinions with the National Archives. So it seems like it would be a good thing to take advantage of that opportunity. And it looks like, as I said, lots of people are already on there, um, you know, giving them their input. So you can check out the Narrations blog at blogs.archives.gov slash online dash public dash access. And yes, I will have that link for you in the show notes. 
Well, I'm very excited because the Salt Lake City Family History Expo is almost here, and I can't wait. (laughs) In fact, I've been waiting all summer for this. It's going to be a terrific genealogy conference, and I had to miss the Denver Expos. So I've been going through Expo withdrawals. This is coming just in time. And what's really cool is that Holly Hansen and the Family History Expo team have just announced that uh, Family Search is offering consultant training at this expo. So if you're a Family Search consultant and you have not received notice from Family Search, you should contact the folks at Family History Expos for more details about how to participate in that. And they have also announced that there are going to be goodies at this conference. Um, Ancestry.com is sponsoring the banquet that they have on Friday night, and they will be giving a free copy of Family Tree Maker 2010 to each banquet attendee. And there are going to be 10 drawings for gifts valued at $400 each. And finally, something else that they are going to do at this expo, if you have to work or you have other conflicts, um, so you can't make the entire thing, um, but you do have time to visit the exhibit hall and attend one or two classes, then you're in luck because they have just added the option to register for single classes at $12 each. I don't think you're going to find that option anywhere else. (laughs) So for more information on the Family History Expo, go to FamilyHistoryExpo.com. And if you go, be sure and stop by the Genealogy Gems booth. I'll be there and say hi. And here's some news that came out recently. MyHeritage.com has announced the release of Family Tree Builder 4.0. And it looks like the key improvements of this new version include a map module, a family toolbar with family chat, and extensive support for albums to organize family photographs, videos, and documents. Um, The founder and the CEO of MyHeritage.com says that With the new map module, people can get an appealing visual representation of their family's life journeys. They can also map the addresses of family members, quickly find all events and photos associated with a particular place, and even standardize place names using smart suggestions. This provides a fascinating new perspective for millions of people interested in their family history. Now, according to MyHeritage's press release, the new Family Toolbar provides direct access to family sites on MyHeritage.com. It's supposed to add a powerful genealogy search, and of course, it features the Family Chat, a text, audio, and video chat system built specifically for family use. The addition of albums for organizing photos, videos, and documents um, makes it an even more useful tool. Family Tree Builder 4.0 also adds slideshows for showcasing family photos in really nice ways and a new screensaver that displays family photos based on tagging and face recognition technology. The Family Tree Builder software is available for free for download at myheritage.com slash family dash tree dash builder. And there was an interesting article um, published about, I think about a week ago on the BBC News online. And it says that Google has lifted the lid on its updated search engine, which developers have nicknamed caffeine. (laughs) Sounds like it's supercharged. Um, Although they're still in testing phase, the firm says that it is the first step in improving the speed, accuracy, and comprehensiveness of search results. It's amazing that they can continue to uh, improve search. I mean, Google search is pretty powerful as it is, and sounds like they are definitely trying to stay on the forefront of things. Um, The new engine is going to replace Google's current one after they're all done with their testing. And there are some folks out there predicting that it's going to um, threaten to put Microsoft's new engine called Bing in the shade, as they put it. (laughs) Um, In fact, uh, this guy, Martin McNulty, he's a marketing specialist and traffic broker. He says, Google has let caffeine quietly slip out. It talked about vertical specific searches while quietly doubling the speed and starts introducing real-time results and news feed. And that really seems to be the trend nowadays. Now, a lot of this improvement to um, Google as well as the Bing website, it's about getting real-time search data and um, to find out what people are talking about right now, what's being published right now. You know, and it it remains to be seen how much that's going to benefit us as genealogists because we're not necessarily looking for, you know, what's the hottest new topic. 
in entertainment or anything else, but um, you never know that it may provide um, instant access to more currently published information. And it looks like that the Google search isn't going to look any different. It should look the same. It's just that the search engine behind Google's you know website is going to be ramped up. Okay, well, that's the news from here, and it's time to hear from you, and we will do that at the mailbox. Regular listener Sean Lamb wrote in to say, I just finished listening to episode 49 today, but couldn't help noticing when you mentioned about your own grandpa, JB, working on the Moffat Tunnel construction crew. As a railroad historian, my ears naturally perk up whenever I hear any connection to rail transport. I knew I had seen a few photos of the construction crew, and a quick look through the Library of Congress's American Memory website showed me the photos that I remembered. The description pages don't list all the names of the people in the photos, and you've probably already seen them, but these three photos are available through the Library of Congress website as part of their Denver Public Library collection. Thanks for the tips and stories that help keep my own inspiration going to continue researching. Thanks, Sean. I definitely went and checked those out. Really cool to see photographs of the of the crews working on the Moffat Tunnel back at the time, you know, when uh, JB was working there. So thank you so much for checking that out and sending it to me. And then just as I was preparing for this episode, another email popped up in my inbox from Sean, and it was titled, You Did It Again. He says... Just when I thought I was going to get caught up listening to Genealogy Gems, episode 69 came up on my MP3 player. The first news item you mentioned about free access to the 1930 census images sent me scanning through the research notes to find anyone and everyone that should have appeared in those records. This, of course, meant that I wasn't paying any attention to the show as I searched for my relatives and will have to listen to it again when I'm through with this task. I was able to find many of the people that I was looking for and spent the next week going through and finding more of my families in the census. My favorite from these records so far was someone on my wife's side of the family living in Allen County, Indiana, who was listed as a sprayer in an automobile factory. We're guessing that he probably worked on the Auburn and Cord factory lines, which were closed later in the 1930s. Another relative on her side was listed as a saddle tree maker. Also, in a previous podcast episode, you mentioned that one of your ancestors was a census enumerator. Well, I got lucky when I looked at the record of my second great-grandfather, Jonathan Rice. The enumerator on the page that listed him was my great-granduncle, Everett J. Beach. Way cool. (laughs) Reading through all of these census records brings up a few more questions for which I wasn't able to find answers yet at the census.gov website. The people who were listed with an occupation all have an entry in the column code for office use only, do not write in this column. Was this just a way for the main office to assign a standardized number for each job title, which was then aggregated into a count of how many people worked in each job type? Or does this point to additional records that can be requested? Also, for most of the people I found that were listed as farmers or farm laborers, there is often an entry in the last column on the enumeration sheet for number of farm schedule. Again, does this column point to more records that I can request? There is one fun item that I found while looking for answers to these questions. The Census Bureau has a PDF copy of a blank form that included sample family stories so enumerators could practice entering the data from the stories. I'll have to try this out to get a better idea of how the data was entered. Now, if only there was a copy of an answer sheet to this practice form. (laughs) You're absolutely right, Sean. I've taken a look at that, and I was thinking the same thing. There should be an answer sheet. Well, Sean, you are a great example of perfect podcast listening. The trick is to hear something and jump on it. Now, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and that's exactly what I do. Otherwise, I forget about it, and it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. So (laughs) I am glad that what you're hearing on the shows is leading you to um, get out there and search and, and get some new discoveries. That is very cool. Now about your census question. 
your guess was correct about the codes. They are to help with tabulation. So let me give you a little bit of background on that. Now, the census.gov website has a lot of great information um, and history census and all that kind of stuff. But you're, if you're interested in the actual instructions that the enumerators received, um, to, to read the actual instruction pamphlet that they got, you got to go to the IPUMS USA website. It's at USA dot i p u m like mary s dot org the site is described as census microdata for social and economic research it is an excellent and little known gem that is dedicated to collecting and distributing us census data and it has three goals they want to collect and preserve data and documentation harmonize data and disseminate the data absolutely free So I'm going to have a link in the show notes for you in case you're interested for the 1930 census enumerator instructions, as well as a page that gives you a list of all the census years for anybody out there listening who's interested in learning more about what the enumerator was told to do in any particular census year. It actually is really interesting stuff. But as that column implies, the census taker was instructed actually not to write in column 26D, which is the one you're referring to. So in this case, the instructions can't help much. Column 26D, you're right, was filled in by the staff at the Census Bureau after the census taker completed their task. The codes that they wrote in that column were to assist them in tabulating statistical information, which they reported to Congress. Unfortunately, That means that these numbers don't really provide any additional information because they really do just reflect what was written in the occupation columns by the census taker. But if you have a curious streak and you would like to see exactly what the codes meant, I've got another little gem for you. Um, Steve Morse, the author of the One Step Tools, shares your curiosity and he created a page on his website called Deciphering Language and Nativity Codes Appended to the 1930 Census in One Step. (laughs) And um, it's got all kinds of great goodies on there. You'll find a button on there that goes to, it starts out with the first couple of columns. There's a button that takes you on to additional ones. I've got the link directly to the page that actually gives you the search engine for these occupation codes. So you can enter the codes um, from their drop-down menus, and it will pop up exactly what they translated into. So um, I actually wrote Sean, and I asked him to send me the census records that he was looking at so I could take a look and do a little test run to see how it works with the one-step tools. So the first person that he has was Everett J. Beach, And it was occupation code 4873. And so if you put in 48 in the first column and 73 in the second column, um, 48 translates into salesmen or saleswomen. And 73 translates into automobile, laundry, or greasing station, garage, greasing station, auto. (laughs) And so when I took a look at, at the census image that Sean sent me, for him. Indeed, he's recorded as his occupation being salesman and the industry being garage. So as you can see, it doesn't give you much new information, but you know, it's kind of interesting to try it out. Um, The other ancestor that he sent me was Emerson Beach. His code was 1501. Uh, This is Sean's great grandfather and brother to Everett Beach. And 15 means fireman, except locomotive and fire department. And 01 means brick, tile, and terracotta factories, yard, refractory, sewer pipe. So again, falls exactly in line with um, how Everett is recorded by the census taker as well. Sean also mentioned that um, Donald Beach, who is the son of Emerson, was listed in the household, and his code is quite different. It's V1VV. And actually, um, if you have looked at a lot of census records, you've probably seen this code quite often and wondered, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> but exact, it, what it means is exactly what it will say in the occupation column, which is laborers, wage workers, and the industry being agriculture. 
So it's kind of fun to know the background. It's kind of fun to know that you can pop those codes in there and see. And actually, it was interesting because Sean had written in the in the email to me that the code for Everett Beach was 4873. But actually, when I put that code in, it did not come up properly with what was written on the image. And so I took another look at it and I thought, you know, I think that says 4573. I put in 45 and that's what brought up salesman. And then, of course, 73 was automobile laundry or greasing station. So that was a little um, quirk and, and helped to make sure that the transcription of the information, if he wanted to transcribe that number, was accurate. And Sean, you asked about the farm number column, and you're right, that actually alludes to a whole other set of special census records. You know, the population census is just one of several censuses taken, and actually, you can learn more about that by listening to the Family Tree Magazine podcast, episode number 12, and it's called Census Secrets, and I interviewed Kurt Witcher last year at the FGS conference, and we talked about um, not only the farm schedule, but the mortality schedule and other types of census schedules that were taken um, over the years, and they changed over the years, but that number indeed would give you um, a connection into the agricultural census, and As far as I know, those are not digitized online, but the place to get them is at the National Archives. So if you just do a search on the National Archives and look for the agricultural census, then again, you're going to be honing in on the county where your ancestor lived and go from there. And I believe that there is an information page on the NARA website. I'm going to take a quick look for it. And if I can find that, I will also put that in the show notes to kind of help you help guide you through that process of exploring the agricultural schedule. So a couple of gems there for you. Great questions, Sean. And I'm glad to hear that you're taking good advantage of what you're hearing on the show and and it's helping you out with your research. Ancestry.com recently announced that they are putting together a new tool that's coming online. It's called Member Connect. And much like with the family trees and the little ancestor hints, those shaking leaves that you see, it's another way to try to connect with other researchers. Um, It's pretty new, and some folks have been out on the blog chatting about it and and talking about the pros and cons of, of how it's laid out. And Ancestry is just in the initial stages of launching it. And so I thought it would be a great time to get together and talk with David Graham, who's the Director of Product Management, and he's heading up the Member Connect initiative, and um, have him give us a tour, because it is fairly new, and I thought it would be interesting to not only hear what they've put together so far, but kind of what's in the works for Member Connect as it develops. And I know that David has been really interested in getting additional feedback from users, Now, this is kind of a special interview because we actually did this online, um, almost like a little mini webinar between David and I. He shared his web browser with me over the internet, and so I had a chance to be able to follow along with him as he uh, demoed Member Connect live online. And I was able to capture that demo on video for you. So I know a lot of you um, like to listen to the interviews on the podcast in audio form because you're out and you're walking and doing stuff. But I do have two video versions of this interview for you as well. So today on the show, you'll be hearing the audio of the tour. Of course, you can't see the screen, but David's pretty good at describing what he's talking about. And certainly, you could... uh, turn this on and open up your ancestry and kind of follow along yourself on the web page. But I've also got two videos for you. It's um, Member Connect with David Graham, and you can find that at the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. So far, I've published two sections of the interview. It was actually quite a long um, demonstration that we did. So here on the show and on the first two videos, you'll hear the first two segments of the interview. And in our next episode... I'll publish the rest of the interview. So here we go, learning more about Member Connect with David Graham at Ancestry.com. Well, Ancestry.com has recently announced a new feature. It's called Member Connect. And here to tell us about it is David Graham, Director of Product Management at Ancestry.com. Welcome, David. Thanks very much. It's great to join you. 
Oh, well, I'm really excited to have you here because this looks like a, a very new and innovative um, feature. Uh, it looks quite different than what many of us are used to, and it looks like it has a lot of different components to it. So I'm hoping that you can just take us on a little tour and give us an overview of what Member Connect is really all about and what it offers. But the first question I wanted to ask you was, what prompted the creation of Member Connect at Ancestry? That's a wonderful question. So we do um, kind of research with our with our members and our customers a lot. Um, we bring customers in very frequently to look at products we're building and things like that. And we also do a fair amount of surveying um, as well as kind of um, – watching people's feedback um, on, on our blogs and in the message boards and things like that. And one thing that definitely stood out was that sometimes the most meaningful experience in research or, or the most helpful kind of jump start um, when you're stuck somewhere is connecting with someone else who's researching the same ancestors as you are. Um, and, and as we've watched how much activity there is on the website, we said to ourselves, well, well, there's bound to be a lot of people researching the same things that probably aren't aware that they are and could have some really valuable information to help each other kind of uh, run past roadblocks or to correct information that they had wrong or anything like that. So really the, the intention of all of this is to enable members to, to find other members who are researching the same people they are so that they can, we can kind of begin the process of collaboration. Great. And this was something that your subscribers had asked you about and, and was saying that they were finding helpful Essentially, there there have been some pretty manual ways you could go about finding other members, um, and the people who have used those methods um, th through surveys and other methods have expressed how helpful it's been, um, but it's been pretty manual and somewhat limited. And so, essentially, we wanted to get that ability that some of our more advanced users had figured out um, available to, to everybody. You bet. Well, I know that Ancestry, um, in talking about its new IPO, had announced some of the subscriber numbers, and you have hundreds of thousands <laughs> of subscribers. So there's a lot of people out there to connect with. My guess is, though, that there's probably some challenges with kind of sifting through all of that. So why don't you take us through kind of an overview and give us an idea of what Member Connect can do and how we can hone in on those individual subscribers that might really have things of value for us. And this is kind of the beginning. We want Great. to continue to, based on feedback, improve things. So um, we're definitely open to, to that feedback. So there's a lot of elements of Member Connect, as you mentioned, um, throughout the site. So it, it may be a little hard, hard to get your arms around. So I'll hit each of the, the main points. Um, the first um, that you'll see here on the screen is um, our enhanced image page, it's called. Um, and right well, now we only have it on a select few well, that databases, brings us to the close of, and oh. we are going to progressively add <laughs> more databases. Um, and there's a, there's a number of things going on on this page. Um, part of the things are allowing people to see the, the index at the same time as seeing the image or the transcription at the same time as seeing the image, as well as make it easier to make um, kind of provide alternates if you have reason to believe the index is incorrect. Um, but the Member Connect piece is over here on the right. And there's a few pieces you, you'd see about any record you're looking at. Um, and this, when I mention record, it's for a specific individual. So you'll see here, this one's for um, Mamie Dowd, um, not the image, not everybody on the image. It's just for the one line you're on. Um, also, to clarify, my um, demonstration today, I'm going to do it in our testing environment. So some things um, may not be accurate data. Um, it's a lot of test data and things like that. But that allows me to use the function without actually um, breaking anything in my own tree. So um, on this record, the things you'll see is you if there are comments on the record, you can see those and you can leave your own comment. Um, also, depending upon members' privacy settings, which I'll touch briefly on at the end, um, we can show um, other members who have saved this record. So if somebody has saved this record to a, a public family tree on our site, um, you could see who that member was, look at their profile. You could also click through to see that um, person in their public tree. They may have other discoveries you didn't know about, um, maybe a photo that they had of your ancestor that you weren't aware of, things like that. And you can also just start a dialogue with that person. Um, 
then in addition to records that are saved uh, or who else has saved it, um, we'll also list um, who else has contributed to, um, to this uh, to record to make corrections. So for example, if you click that you can see um, a correction on the name. And right now actually in our test environment, that spot isn't displaying exactly as it ought to be. So my apologies there. Um, finally, two other things um, that are useful, especially if, if you don't have other routes to go, this is kind of a dead end for you. One would be related message boards on our site, so message boards for this location or for this um, surname if we have them. And then finally, if there are other members who have publicly stated in their profile on the site, their member profile, that they are researching this name and location, um, we'll give you a, a list of those people. So you might have people that are experts in this name and location that you could ask for additional assistance. So it's really just trying to highlight the activity going on in our record and other people, other members you might want to interact with based on your interest in this record. David, the first thing I notice when I'm looking at this is I think it's really neat that you have the index on the same page as the image because, as you say, oftentimes you're kind of jumping back and forth or you might be making some corrections. But the Member Connect site on the right, that reminds me a lot of the shaking leaf on our trees that we see and how we connect with people. Is this an extension of that same feature and what prompted putting it on the actual image page? Trying to solve a similar thing as the shaky leaves or the ancestry hints, as we call them, in that it's, it's trying to point you at resources we think might be helpful to you. So in that, in spirit, they're, they're similar. Um, it's doing some fairly different things than that is. Um, and the reason for putting it here is really to make sure, um, whenever possible, that finding a record is not a dead end, right? But that you can get there, you can learn everything you can from the record first of all, that you can verify the information and um, learn whatever you can learn, for example, the occupation from the census or whatever it may be. But then from there, have a jumping point um, into other information. This is also available for um, all of our members who don't uh, maintain a tree on our site. Um, you can then learn um, just from the from using the records without having to have a tree on our site. That answered my second question. Yeah, I was just wondering, do you have to have a tree? But I could see that this would at least give you a taste of what possible connections there are and might help you to make a determination if a tree would be in your best interest. This at least surfaces some, some potential other leads that you might dig into um, to further your research wherever it is you're organizing it. We'll have more with David Graham on the Member Connect tool at Ancestry.com right after this. Would you like to boost your genealogy research and break through those brick walls? Well, here's your answer. Become a Genealogy Gems Premium Member. You'll get two extra members-only episodes every month packed with great tips that you can use right away and instructional videos walking you through the best internet tools step-by-step. Step. In the current series called Google, A Goldmine of Genealogy Gems, I'll show you how to get the most out of Google. If you enjoy the Genealogy Gems podcast, then you're going to love being a Genealogy Gems premium member. This is Tim Cox. I'm a premium member, and I have been for a while. I just wanted to call and let you know that I really enjoyed being a premium member, and one of the perks I like about it is the videos. I learned how to build my own genealogy dashboard. The videos were called Google, a gold mine of genealogy gem, and because I made that dashboard, I'm able to monitor all the blogs and the websites that interest me, and I was able to create tabs so each tab has different topics and just go to each one I want. This is like the best thing since sliced bread. So Lisa, thank you for what you're doing and I really do enjoy your podcast. To become a premium member, go to my website at genealogygems.tv and click the Join Today button. And by entering the special coupon code SAVE20, that's S-A-V-E-2-0, you'll get 20% off the annual membership. Genealogy Gems Premium Membership. It's where you belong. And now back to segment two of Member Connect with David Graham. The next step happens in the member tree area. Um, so this is for individuals who have a tree um, hosted on their site that they're building with us. Um, and so this is specific to that area. Um, in the new design of the profile page for individuals in your tree, there's a tab called Member Connect here. Um, and in that, there's really three specific areas. And I'm going to actually go in backwards order because it, uh, um, 
makes a little bit more sense how the pieces play together. Um, so the first thing is that we will list what we call suggested connections. So essentially we're checking other public member trees um, to see if, if there are other members that are publicly researching the same person as you are. Um, if they are, we will list each of them here on this page and we'll also highlight which information in their tree is something you don't have, that's what's labeled new, or is different than something you have and that's labeled conflicting. We'll also list any um, attached records they have from us as sources. Um, so you can really evaluate first, is, is this really a good match for my ancestor or the person in my tree? And secondly, do I trust their research? Is this somebody that I'd like to connect with or not? Um, and you can also see who the user is, and this is a, a test account, so it's an unusual name, but you can click and see information about their profile. And so you can learn about both the tree that we're matching on and the member. Um, and so this is a place where there is some overlap with the ancestry hints that you mentioned. Um, some of the people that would be on this list would also be people that we would suggest to you um, in one of those leaves if you're interested in saving information from other trees through that. Um, and you can connect either by saving the information, so if you accepted the hint from somebody, that essentially connects you, um, and then you can do that here. Um, and there's really two main benefits of of connecting with someone, uh, maybe three. Um, one is essentially it kind of saves them in a list for you so you can easily get back to them to contact the member or, or check on the tree. Secondly is this kind of comparison of, of what's in, in their tree that's different or additional to what's in your tree um, with some options to, once you've evaluated that, decide what you want to save into your tree. And then finally it allows you to kind of stay up to date on new discoveries they're making. So I'll show you kind of each of those pieces. Uh, but here, really, your, your step is if, if it's somebody that looks interesting to you that you'd like to have those benefits around, just click Connect. If it doesn't seem like a good match or they don't seem like the type of risk research you're interested in being connected with, you can just click Ignore or um, even leave them on this list if you'd like. If you click Ignore, will that remove them from the list? So if you click Ignore, they'll come off of this list, and if you scroll to the bottom of the page, it'll state how many ignored connections you have. And you can always click on that to see who they are if you change your mind. But so it gets them really, really out of your way, but you could come back to them if you'd like. Um, just as an example, this is one uh, connection that has a possible connection that has a lot more source records attached to them. So that may be somebody, oh, I, I'd like to connect with that person, that first person who didn't, or some of these at the top. Again, this is just test data. Um, maybe I'm less interested in connecting with. So then it, um, the next step would be to kind of move to the connections, and this will look very much like that last list. This is essentially Great. the people you've already connected to. Um, and the real um, difference here is this new and conflicting, which again, the conflicting means it doesn't match exactly what you have, um, but you have kind of that same information, and new is you don't have that information at all. Here you can do something with this information if you're so inclined. So, for example, again, this is test data, so we can see a lot of different alternatives here. Um, this new example, um, I could click on this, and it gives me a few different options. Um, I could save that to my tree. Um, if I've looked at it closely enough and think that it's, it's valid, I could save it into my tree. I could also click through to this other member's tree and see it in context in their tree. Or if I say, you know, I never heard about Doug Doors. There's no source record for this. I'm not that interested. You could click Ignore, and then it would take that labeling off so that we don't kind of bother you about it anymore. For conflicting um, information, um, you kind of have the same options. If you choose to update your tree, there's a few advanced options for you here that are uh, more kind of robust for the conflicting information. So um, if you already have, in this instance, a birth um, events in your tree, we want to make sure we um, don't, nothing changes in your tree that you don't for sure want to change. So by default, nothing will be selected. It's just going to show what you have in your tree here, um, and we're not going to change anything. It's for you to decide what and how you change something. So you might say, okay, I didn't have Boone in the location, and you could check that here, and then it would update your tree. Um, if you want it to look a little different, you can still edit it here and you could say United States, if that's your preferred method for, for listing that location. 
Um, additionally, a lot of times you may say, well, you know, that's interesting. I want to dig into that one a little bit more and keep track of it, but I'm not right. yet ready to change anything in my tree. So then you have this added checkbox here for adding it as an alternate birth event. Um, some of our events are kind of alternates. It's just additional data points that you could bring in. But either way, you could add this as something new without changing what you already had. And so here it's going to leave my birth information exactly as it is and then simply add an alternate with this information. Um, if this person had source records um, associated to it, um, that would be listed here and you could save that in as well. Um, and actually, I'll just show you a quick example of one of those. Um, so um, it would it would bring those associated source records that they have um, into your tree as well. Unless you choose not, you, not to, you could always uncheck those. And obviously, we would hope that you click through and look at those records first um, right here, um, which this link would suggest that you do as well, just to go view that record and evaluate it um, before bringing in any of the information. That way you can actually verify the source, the quality of the source that they're using, that you agree that it's a match before you go forward. Exactly, exactly. And that's how we would hope um, people would approach this first. Well, I hope you enjoyed these first two segments of my interview with David Graham over at Ancestry.com. If you'd like to watch the video version, I encourage you to do that so that you can um, check it out and really follow along and see what he was showing us. Go to YouTube.com slash user slash Genealogy Gems to view the videos on the Genealogy Gems TV channel at YouTube. You know, I love bringing these genealogical gems to you that help boost your research and build a strong family tree. And it's important to me to always have free podcasts available so that everyone can participate. If you enjoy these free shows and you would like to help me cover the costs of bringing them to you each week, there's a really easy way to do that that won't cost you a thing. By coming to my website at genealogygems.tv whenever you need to do some shopping online and accessing your favorite stores and websites through the links that you find on my site, you financially support the show. The price you pay is exactly the same, but Genealogy Gems receives a small percentage for referring you. It's just that simple. Amazon is one of my all-time favorite places to shop online. They have just about everything and at incredibly competitive prices. So next time you're looking for books, DVDs, software, electronics, apparel, pretty much anything at all, head to genealogygems.tv and click the Amazon ad that you find on the homepage or throughout the website. And these free podcasts will benefit by any shopping that you do and you will get the same super low prices. Everybody wins. So if you enjoyed the Genealogy Gems podcast and the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast, let your mouse do the shopping through the ads and links on the Genealogy Gems website, and together we'll keep new episodes coming for a long time to come. Well, that brings us to the close of Episode 70 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. My thanks to David Graham over at Ancestry.com, and you can look forward to more from David Graham on the future episode of Genealogy Gems podcast. And of course, to stay up to speed on everything going on with Genealogy Gems, be sure and sign up for the free e-newsletter. Just go to the website at genealogygems.tv and click the sign up button in the column on the left. And when you do that, you will get my 20 page ebook. It's called Five Fabulous Google Research Strategies for the Family Historian. And that's just a thank you gift for signing up for the newsletter. And again, I hope to see you over at the Family History Expo in Sandy, Utah, just outside of Salt Lake City on August 28th and 29th. I'm going to be teaching three classes as well as videotaping some interviews. And of course, I'll be at the Genealogy Gems booth in the exhibit hall. And finally, if you have any questions or comments, you can always email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Or you can leave a recorded voicemail message at the voicemail line and have it included here on the show. Uh, just call 925-272-4021. Well, thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.